those who are just joining in to the stream. Uh, this is the type of um, watercolor landscapes we'll be playing with today. Actually, there are two different types of landscapes we'll be playing with. This is another one right here. I call this one Satin Skies because this just reminded me of, um, I don't know, satin for some reason. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Oh, but also, um, that's landscapes that have multiple colors, but you can also just use one color of watercolor and make a painting like this. So it just depends on how much water you have here and your different, um, different portions of the landscape, the perspective of the landscape, what's in way in the background, what is in the foreground. And what you'll find is the colors in the background should be super wishy-washy like that. And then you put a little more color in it and then a little more color in it. And your darkest colors will be in the foreground like that. So a lot of people will, in this area, they might throw a different color in there a little stronger to show that perspective wise, it's closer to uh, the viewer. But um, this was all done with one color. And um, if you're a beginner, this is not easy to do. <laughs> if you're a beginner, it takes some time, it takes getting to know watercolors, how to use water with the watercolors to get the differing uh, tones. Hey, Collector 101, Welcome in. We are doing a watercolor class. And then after the watercolor class, I'll have some giveaways. Um, this is one of the pieces that will be given away. This is a watercolor uh, landscape, what I call an ethereal landscape. So it's what we'll be talking about and I will be teaching today. And then at the end, we will be giving this card. This is a greeting card. So we'll be giving the greeting card an envelope away. I did sign it. That's how you know it's done, right? <laughs> when I put my signature on it, then it should be done at that point. And this is actually um, gouache watercolor. So the watercolor comes in transparency and opaques. And of course, everything in between but this in particular are gouache watercolors. So they are watercolors that are more opaque and I put it on a blue paper instead of just putting it on um, a white paper so that the blue of the paper would be the sky in general. And then I just wanted to quickly capture the beautiful purple uh, and white clouds that I saw right outside my door. <laughs> one evening i was like oh i have to go throw that uh onto so it's a cloudscape as opposed to a mountainscape there all right more ethereal landscapes this one is a a grove of trees so i uh, the type of art that i like to do is more abstract and uh so these very wishy-washy watercolor type paintings like this that suggests something rather than realistic. I mean, there are some people who can do watercolor that are amazing and they, they get very realistic, but I like to do watercolor that's very um, suggestive, impressionist, impressionist instead of being um, specific <laughs> and realistic. Now this one is uh, gonna give you a forest look, but there's some, let me take it out of the, wrapper there so that you can see that there is some play of shimmer in there. And so that shimmer comes from uh, something called shimmer watercolors. And here's an example of a little box of shimmer watercolors. So there's actually mica in those watercolors. And I use that usually at the end to come in and pop some nice shimmer colors into the watercolors. So we're going to do that. And this is one that I did last night and it's very wishy-washy. You put your paint down here, you add lots of water here and lots of water here. Super fun to do. Um, I'm actually going to, with you, uh, do one of these as a warm up. A great way to get started in understanding the play of water and paint um, in 
doing this kind of artwork that's more, as I say, more ethereal, we're going to be working a lot with water. There's a lot of push and pull of water. What do I mean by push and pull? I mean, you're going to lay color down and then it seems counterintuitive, but then you're going to lift some of that color back out. And by doing that, you are able to get your um, more softer, diffused light in these pieces. So for instance, you see how this is very light in here. This was all the same color, but afterwards I went in with a brush with just water on it and I picked up some of that color along here to give it that sort of misty look. So there's a little color there, but a lot of the color has been lifted off. So that is the push is putting the paint down and the pull is lifting the color back out in order to get that those soft edges and that misty look to the paint. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the supplies that we'll be using today for the workshop. And that is watercolor paper, of course. So this is a block that uh, came from Hobby Lobby. It's super cute. The um, It's not very expensive. You see here $7.99. And hey, if you have a coupon, you might be able to get it for less. But it's a good, um, if you don't want to spend a lot of money on paper, it's an excellent uh, all around starting paper. So this is Master's Touch from over, that's their brand at Hobby Lobby. And I like the square, um, the square size, but there aren't a lot of frames for square size. So I don't, I don't do a lot of squares just for that reason, because you want to be able to take it and put it in a nice frame. This is going to require, um, this one happens to be an eight inch by eight inch. So it's going to require uh, you to take it to a somewhere where uh, they can frame it for you, right? Which is not all bad. I have lots of artwork in my house that is framed and uh, by professional framers and it looks fabulous. But um, if you want something that's more ready where you can take it to a craft store and just buy a frame for it, then you want to work in your standard sizes of uh, eight by 10, well, five by seven, eight by 10, um, nine by 12, and 11 by 14. And so I'm going to put this eight by eight one away. We're not going to use that tonight. <laughs> but what we've got here also is this is my favorite all around watercolor paper. Um, I use it for my finished artwork. I use it for swatching. So swatching means that you're putting down just and testing your colors. It's excellent for that. Um, so it's by a company called Kansan, which is also a very old paper company. And this happens to be their XL watercolor. Now what you're looking for is a watercolor paper that is at least what they call 140 pound. This is my all around workhorse paper. And I normally get the size nine by 12. And the reason is that a nine by 12, it, it has several uses. The nine by 12 will fit into an 11 by 14 mat. So this is an 11 by 14 mat, 11 inches by 14 inches. And your artwork done on a nine by 12 will fit perfectly inside that. So the one that I just had a second ago, this, is done on 9 by 12 right here. So this is the 9 by 12 Canson paper I just showed you. And it fits perfectly into the 11 by 14 mat like that. So you can see there's room around the edges for you to tape it on. All right. And, uh, and then also you can take the 11 by 14 paper and you can cut it in half. And then you have two pieces that will fit into an eight by 10 mat. <laughs> so you'll get one painting that fits an 11 by 14 mat. You'll get two paintings that will fit into a mat like this. Oop, not that one, sorry. Uh, a mat like this. So this is your standard eight inch by 10 inch. And so your, if you cut that nine by 12 in half, it's going to fit and allow you to tape it inside an eight by 10 mat like that. Um, 
and here's what they look like when I cut them in half. So then I have the two halves here. And then also I use this Canson paper nine by 12 to make my artist cards. So my artist, um, what are sometimes called artist trading cards, but here's one of the artist cards here. It's a piece of original artwork, but it's the size of a trading card, like a sport trading card or a Pokemon trading card. And so it's two and a half inches by three and a half inches. And on that nine by 12 paper, I can get nine of those. I, I work on one sheet and then I get nine of them going all at the same time in a collection. So that's the advantage of using this nine by 12 paper uh, instead of the 11 by 14, which is a little bit larger, uh, but the 11 by 14, I feel like since these mats are 11 by 14, you actually waste a lot of your paper because it's exactly the same size as this mat. Um, so that's just some hints from an old artist. <laughs> with why I like the 9 by 12 paper. And then this is called a watercolor block. So again, notice it's by Canson, but it's a, a, it's a higher grade of your watercolor paper. And a block means that it is glued on the edges. So all the edges are glued and that assures that your paper stays relatively flat as you work with it and you add a lot of water to it. I'll show you what happens on the Canson paper here. If you add a lot of water as you're painting, you see that, how this curled up? So when it curls up, what happens is that affects the wishy-washiness of your paint and where it's going to pool. So you get these poolings on your paper when of course it curls on you but if it's in a watercolor block that is glued on all the edges you'll have a little bit of bowing just a tiny bit of bowing usually from the center out but you won't get that curl like i got on the canson paper that was not um, in a block now, of course, we can tape our paper down, and that's what I'm going to do when we actually start painting overhead. Now, one of the things with these blocks is you have to be able to separate the sheets. There are a whole bunch of sheets in here. So each block somewhere on the edges here will have an area where there's no glue, just a small area with no glue. And then what I do is I take my palette knife and I slide it inside that area and then go all around the edges and that will take off the, uh, this one happens to not have glue in this one little corner right here. And so that's where I would put my uh, palette knife in there and then go all around the edges to take, to pop it off after my artwork is done and dry. Okay, so that's a, a nice benefit of having your watercolor paper in a block instead of having it loose. But if you don't have a block, and you have loose paper, then what uh, we're going to do is we're going to take one of the sheets. Oops, hold on a second. I put it down. We're going to take one of these sheets. That is a half sheet, right, of the 9 by 12. And we're actually going to tape it down onto just a clipboard. See how I have a clipboard there? So it'll tape perfectly down onto a clipboard. And what we're gonna use to tape it down is something called washi tape. Now, um, the other tape that I recommend is called um, artist tape. And artist tape comes in many different colors. I usually use the white one, um, but you want a low tack tape. Some people use the blue painter's tape. Um, you just have to experiment with your paper and make sure your paper is heavy enough that when you tape it on and then you go later to take it off that the tape doesn't tear your paper. So a lot of people use what's called washi tape, which are these pretty de decorated tapes. It's spelled W-A-S-H-I. Never thought about using washi. Yes, yes. Well, it's a beautiful way to glue down your artwork while you're working, uh, in my opinion anyway. So I have lots of different rolls of washi tape that I have 
purchased on whatnot from other uh, craft people who were auctioning them. And um, it's a low tack tape, which is perfect for gluing down, um, for anchoring down your artwork while you're painting. So we're gonna do that in a little bit, make sure that we uh, tape that down. So let me set that aside. And let's talk about brushes real quick, like um, before we talk about the paint. So the kind of brushes that I'm going to be using with watercolor, uh, I'm going to read a comment here. Let's see. I do know if you use painter's tape and leave it on too long, it's hard to remove. Exactly, GR um, card designs. Now, one trick that I have used in the past is if you're using that blue painter's tape, and you need to take it off and it's it's sticking a little bit more because you did leave it for longer what you can do is warm it so i use my heat gun my heat tool that i have like this you don't want to get it too hot because um, this gets very hot at the end but you can warm it gently and then that will help the glue also to release. It may leave behind a little bit of stickiness, in which case you want to use, I'm looking for it right here, you'll want to use a, an, a rubber cement eraser like this. It's, a, it's called a pickup eraser because it's not designed to erase in the typical way of erasing a pencil line. It's designed to pick up uh, glue. So you can use one of these to pick up that excess glue, all right? Um, so the kind of brushes we're gonna be using this for this uh, workshop are, this is a Christy Rice. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Love her, she's on uh, YouTube. Uh, Christy with a K, K-R-I-S-T-Y, last name R-I-C-E. And uh, this is one of her brushes that she's designed. And I love how much water and pigment this holds, but then it also has a nice, uh, snap, what I call a snappy tip. So it comes to a nice point there and that holds a lot of water. Then this one is a Princeton brush, uh, Princeton Velvet Touch. Yep, love these brushes for watercolor. Again, you see the tip is uh, pointed and it's nice and snappy. These are synthetic, they're not natural hair. Um, one that I use to remove the water with is this Princeton Lauren. Um, now you'll notice the tip is not as pointy, right? It's a little softer and more round. So I find that working with brushes that have a little bit of a rounded tip are perfect for me to go back in with a little bit of water and lift some of that color back out uh, when I'm wanting to lighten an area. So I do like this Lauren version, or there's another one here. This is the Heritage version, also has a little bit more of a rounded top instead of that point sticking up. And so you'll know by, this one says Princeton Heritage right here. This one says Princeton Lauren, and the other one said um, Princeton Velvet Touch. So they do have different um, versions of their brushes. And that's, you know, when you're standing in the store, right? You're standing in an art store and you're like, why the, this is, when I was a, a beginning artist, I'd, be, I'd stand there and go, why do art, like why do manufacturers make so many different kinds of brushes? This is insane. And then you start painting <laughs> and then you paint for years. And then you're like, gee, I would like a brush that was a little snappier. I'd like a brush that was a little softer. I'd like one that was a little more rounded. I'd like one with a longer A. I mean, that's like, once you start actually painting uh, regularly, then there are, uh, you get different strokes with the different types of tips. And this one that's the Heritage has a little bit rounder top and not so much that pointy top. So I like to use this rounded top one for leaves, for instance. I like the effect that I get for leaves from that one. Um, then another brush that I'm like, anytime I do watercolor, I have to have this brush. <laughs> and it is part of the Princeton Velvet Touch line, but it's, is, it's called the Willow Blender. And it's called the Blender because these are hard. It's a combination of soft and hard tip. So 
if I make a mistake and I need to lift up a bunch of that paint right away, I use this stiffer brush to do that so that I can lift out any mistakes. I mean, I, I tend to paint with lots of water, lots of paint flying, and I'm always getting little dots everywhere. And so I'm constantly needing to lift those up and this is the brush that I use for that. Another benefit of this um, Willows blender is that it's it's not a wood handle, it's a plastic handle, and it has this really cool uh, angled tip to it right here. So uh, there's a neat effect you can do with watercolor where you scrape back into it, and wherever you scrape on the paper, the um, you'll tend to get a little bit darker uh, paint deposited where you scrape the paper and so I like to use the back end of this Willows blender to do that. Of course you'll need water too, okay? <laughs> we are working with watercolor. And so this is a big soppy brush. They call it a spalter, S-P-A-L-T-E-R. This is uh, Princeton Neptune and um, as you can see it is a soft, super soft brush that will hold a lot of water and it's the first project we're going to do uh, we're going to do two paintings so the first one we're going to do is like the one that i showed you that had the land and then the trees above it and you need to deposit a lot of water on your paper so that's what this brush is for is depositing a lot of water on your paper now you could just as easily use a brush like this called a mop brush all right, which has a big old mop on the end, which looks like, you know, you were going to apply makeup with it, right? <laughs> but I assure you, this is a paintbrush, not a makeup brush. And uh, it's called a mop. It's used to hold lots of water in it so that, again, you can get that wishy-washy water look. Um, geez, here's an even bigger one that I have that is uh, the Princeton Neptune. And again, it, there are a lot of hairs in there, so it'll hold a lot of water for when you need to deposit water and then let the watercolor flow into it. That's the cool thing that we're going to be seeing here shortly. Um, let me think if there are any other brushes that I want to mention. I do want to mention uh, what some people call a cat's tongue. So you can see it comes up like this. Actually, when it's wet, it comes to a point right there. And uh, called a cat tongue. Some people call it an oval wash. This one happens to come from Walmart, uh, not Walmart, I'm sorry, from uh, Hobby Lobby. It's the Master's Touch brand. And uh, But I love the little, what they call the cat's tongue here. And that will also deposit a lot of water. But because it has this little, the shape, you can be a little more precise where you put the water, um, depending on what it is that you're doing. Like when we're working on the mountains and they have a specific slant to them, you want to be able to direct your water just where you want it instead of uh, just having it go everywhere like we're going to do on the first uh, project there. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about paints. My favorite, 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 favorite kind of paint uh, to use for watercolor is a tube paint. So that's a paint like this. It comes in a tube. Uh, they're all different size tubes. So this is, I think, a 15 milliliter. Yep, 15 milliliter. That's kind of standard for your larger sizes. Five milliliter, which is the one I had showed you earlier. This one that I'll be giving away if we have good, uh, good questions and comments. And so this is a set. This is by Holbein. And sometimes you'll see these uh, go to auction. And it is a full set of Holbein watercolors. So if you look at the box, and the box says HWC, that's the Holbein uh, logo. HWC, that means Holbein watercolors. Holbein has watercolors and they also have gouache. So you need to um, remember the gouache is just opaque watercolor. And uh, so if you want the actual transparency of watercolors, you would be looking for sets like this. And um, this has the beautiful tubes. And I love tube watercolor because it's so dang juicy straight out of the tube. Now, what some people do is they'll take these tubes and they will squeeze them into what are called pans. So this is a pan right here, that's actually a half pan and then a little bit bigger 
rectangle is a full pan. And then you can buy sets that already have the pans in them. Um, and like I said, I prefer working from the tubes, but you can just as easily work with the watercolor from the pans. If you want the color to be more bold and more concentrated, then I would suggest the tubes. Or also, um, for instance, Pebio has, these are liquid watercolors and they're very concentrated. The difference is this is a dye-based paint, so it can fade over time. And this is a pigment-based paint. Um, so that means they actually ground up different types of minerals to create this. And that, um, hold on just a second. All right, so then that uh, means this has more permanence in general, all right? There are certain colors in the red family that don't have permanence, but that's because they don't get extracted from minerals. They actually come from bugs and other types of plants. So <laughs> if you're grabbing your minerals from uh, ground up bugs or um, an extract from a plant, sometimes those can be colors that may not stay for 50 years or 100 years. But in general, if you have a good quality paint that's very, what they call light fast, that means that it will um, stand the test of time. At least 50 years, it should stay approximately the same brightness. But uh, just like with clothing, you want to try to keep it away from the sunlight when you put it up on the windows. Hey, welcome in, welcome in the new folks that are coming into the stream. We are simulcasting on YouTube as well at my YouTube channel, which is Tristina Dietz Art. Um, oh, thanks for the hearts. I appreciate that. So this set right here of the tube watercolors by Holbein, um, they are super concentrated out of that little tube. So here's an example of swatching. So swatching means that you just take some of the color with some water on a brush and you put it on some watercolor paper so that you can see what the color is. Because even if the color has the same name from, you know, going from one company to a different company, the color formula for that other company can actually be different. So, <laughs> so it's helpful to swatch your colors out. So I swatched the 12 from the set I just showed you. And then I also tried a few mixes here. So um, a lot of times when people swatch, meaning they're putting the colors down, they're testing them out, they will also do grids where they show various common mixes between colors. Like for instance, if you want a green, you mix your yellow and blue. Well, you may not have just one yellow and you may not have just one blue. For instance, here, we happen to have one yellow, but up here we have two blues in this set. So you wanna see how does this yellow look when it's blended with the one blue versus the other blue for the purposes of creating your own variations of green, for instance, or creating an orange where you're using your yellow and you're combining it with your crimson or your reds. Um, to see where, uh, what kind of oranges you can get out of that. So um, there's a whole, whew, there's a whole uh, area of expertise about color mixing and um, pigment combinations in order to get you various uh, colors. And we have somebody here on Whatnot, and his account is Critter Crops, Critter Crops, and he is a pigment nut. He knows an incredible amount. Um, and if there's somebody in the stream who can tag him, I'm not sure he was live earlier today. I expect that he's not live now, but if he's on whatnot, he might want to pop in and see what we're talking about because we're going to be talking about his paints. <laughs> and so he loves pigments so much that he makes his own paints for himself, which you can also do. You can get pigments and combine them and put them with a watercolor medium and mull, what's called mull them and make your own paints. And so that's what Critter uh, Chops does. And here's, it's Critter Chops, C-H-O-P-S. And um, 
So he has made some of his own watercolors and I buy them from him right here on Whatnot. And so let me show you, for instance, he uh, creates the colors and then puts them in these little half pans. So that is his yellow. And you can see here that I used his paints and I swatched them all out. Look at all the different blues. Whoa, that's a lot of blues. And uh, so there are all these different versions of blue that he makes. And um, I just, I love supporting uh, artisans. So other people who also are creatives and creators. And um, so I love buying handmade paints. That's what these are called. These are handmade paints. See how dark that is? You can't even tell what it is there, but it is a blue. <laughs> and uh, so the only way you're going to know is by swatching it out on the white or uh, sometimes dark paper, depending on what your pigments are. And um, so the line that's in here is actually an oil pastel. I wanted to see how opaque or transparent they were. Sometimes you'll see people put a black line with a Sharpie or some sort of permanent ink down, and then they will um, put the paint over top of it so they can see if the paint has is fully transparent or has any opacity to it at all. Like for instance here, this brown has a little bit of opaqueness and this green has a little bit of opaqueness, meaning it's covering up a little bit of that oil pastel. Normally an oil pastel will repel the color, just like a crayon. You could just take a kid's crayon and do it as well. Um, and that will, the wax will repel the paint unless it's slightly opaque and then it might uh, try to cover it. So that is the series of paints that I have from Critter Chops that we will be playing with as we do our um, our ethereal landscapes because look at all these blues that he has oh created fantastic and i used some of those in this piece yeah and then um besides the actual swatching like this i also did some combinations with his paints so uh, getting oranges by adding the yellow and the red that i purchased from him and then all these different kinds of greens that I got, how? By using his yellow together with all of his different blues to get these variations. My favorite variation from him is this Yin Min blue. So it looks bright in here, but it actually looks quite a bit darker when it dries and the yellow. So I put these two together to create a green. And when I did that, oh my gosh, as it dried, it separated. So this is called granulation. And what happened here was some of that yin min blue, the particles settled out. And so you get these really cool separations where you have, it's like a duo tone. You have this light green, but then you also have this little spattering of blue in there. And I think that's so cool. And you know what? You wouldn't know that unless you did this, <laughs> unless you went ahead and did some swatching, right? Now, um, for the project that we're going to do tonight, the, um, these are some tube paints. So I felt when I looked at the combination of what I had here from Critter Chops was I didn't have a magenta. And when I color mix, um, especially to get really nice purples, you want to mix a good magenta together with your blues. And so the red that he I purchased from him, now he may have a good magenta type color, uh, I just didn't get it from him. And so this he calls Sacred Heart, which is his red, and it's more of a, an orangey red. It, ha it tends more toward yellow. So I can't get the same like punchiness of purples like I have here where I'm doing a combination of magenta and blue. Um, for the Misty Mountains. So therefore, I grabbed out some tubes of other paints that I have here, like this one, for instance, right there. That's a big watercolor tube from Da Vinci. And um, I went ahead and I swatched a bunch more blues, a little bit of green, because in the foreground of our landscape, we want green. 
and then all of these kind of pinks that we can we can put together with these blues and get some amazing uh, unique purples out of it. And then of course, as a finishing touch are the sparkle colors. So you see these have the mica in them and that's what we're gonna put on last. So I always have these handy as I'm doing my painting so I can make decisions as to what colors I wanna grab um, to get the right tonality of what I'm working with. So I'm putting these right over here right now. So they are handy. Let's see, I'm setting them up on my, uh, my equipment over here. So I have the colors at hand. There we go. Thank you, Crater Chops. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead. This one's throwing a little bit of a uh, shadow. Let me put it down here so that we don't get a shadow here. All right, and you're gonna want some sort of palette. So this is just um, a ceramic and you can see the colors that I was using for here, for this one. And I was mixing those inside there. Oh, hold on just a second. It says low battery. We don't want it going dark like I did last week. <laughs> so let me plug that in, got it. Um, now this is just watercolor. So I left this in there so I can show you that if I just put water in here, I can reactivate the colors, but I can also just take pip towel. Oops, hold on a moment. Sorry, out of frame. <laughs> I can take a paper towel and just wipe that right out. And it'll go back to being clean. And this just happens to be a small one. So I'm work when I'm working with smaller brushes or if you're traveling, a small one like this is really good. Um, but when I'm in the studio, and so I, I prefer the ceramic over plastic, although I have plenty of plastic. Like for instance, here is a um, palette and it's plastic. So this is where I squeeze the paint from the tubes inside there. And this little flap right here is so that you can put your thumb through it like that. There are little holes here so that you can take your brush and oops, that brush won't work. There you go. You can set your brush there if you need to, if you're working with more than one brush, um, that's what the holes are there for. And then these wells here are for color mixing. So um, perfect for a travel palette and these you can customize with the tubes to whatever colors you want. This was my one that we made up for my daughter. Um, okay, let me show you some of the other palettes here. So this is my favorite, and this is my favorite one um, all around. And it's called a slant palette because these, it slants down, which means that your paint and your water stay down in here. But it's a nice portable size. Um, I take two of these with me whenever I'm traveling. They are a little bit heavy because it's ceramic, but you can see they clean up beautifully just with water. Um, if I'm using certain kinds of paints, sometimes uh, if you, you can even use it for acrylic. And then if the acrylic sticks to it, you just use a little alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, spray it in there, let it sit for a few minutes and whoop, you can pull the acrylic right out of here as well. So that is a slant palette. I especially use the slant palette. My favorite is to use the liquid watercolors like this in the slant palette, it works great. And then this is one that I got at my thrift store, believe it or not, my church thrift store for 25 cents. Isn't that cool? So again, it's just for, it's just ceramic and it gives you these various areas. Cool find, right? Yeah, and they had like three or four of them. I'm like, I'll take those. <laughs> I think it was four of them. So I ended up only paying a buck and I got four of these palettes and uh, I have various versions of this palette going all the time. Like I have different paints that I've put in it. Um, and then the nice thing about watercolor is when you're finished, you just let it dry on the palette and then I just store them in a stack. And then when I want to paint again, I just look for the color combination that I want and I just pull it out, spray it down with some water and you're good to go. <laughs> All right, and the last uh, 
item that I wanted to mention was watercolor pencils. So the cool thing about watercolor pencils is you can use watercolor pencils or what um, you might see them called aquarellable pencils, meaning they might not call them officially watercolor pencils, but they are pencils that uh, allow you to use them with water. Like for instance, here's one, it's a uh, Derwent's graphy tint, but you see the little brush that's on there. That's kind of a universal thing. They'll put that on there or they'll put the word aquarell or something similar to that. So like this one right here. And that just means that this is aqua welleth. So it's from uh, Austria. And so that just means that this pencil is water soluble. And I love that when I'm um, working on a watercolor painting, you can do your sketches or your outlines with your various colors. And then as you're painting, the color will just melt right in to what you're working on. So these are, um, that's smart. Yeah, thank you. Stay home to shop. <laughs> Appreciate the comment. And um, yeah, so I love it. And you can see the color I use the most. What is it? It's that dark blue. Um, and then also uh, the other thing you can do with those is, now I have to find the card again. Um, what I did here in order to define the tops of these mountains is um, after I initially watercolored this, it didn't, it didn't have the definition that it has now. And that's because I went back in with pencil and I used my watercolor pencil and I outlined these mountains to give them a little more definition. So that is using your watercolor pencils after the fact in order to get a crisper line um, and definition in there if you want to, I find that that comes in really handy. So those, those watercolor pencils are <laughs> awesome. They're not just for doing a whole painting in watercolor pencil, although you can do that. Um, and of course, remember that it's the water that activates it and makes them look amazing. But um, for sure, you're able to use those. And um, I, I, like I said, I, often will do my initial sketch or outline with these. Hey there, Sierra Tara, welcome in, welcome in. We are talking watercolor tonight and um, just ready to go over the table now. Um, one of the things that I'll be doing and um, is also handy to have besides your palettes and all your paints and all that good stuff. Oh yeah, definitely you want your paper towels now. Um, not just any paper towel, y'all. Not just any paper towel. You see how these look like a cloth and they don't have an imprint on them? Why is that important? That's important because sometimes you want to wet an area on your artwork and then you want to put a cloth down on top of it to pull some of that paint out. And you don't want to have a cloth that has a pattern to it. You want a smooth cloth. So these are Viva paper towels, V-I-V-A. And I always use these in the studio for that reason, because yes, they're paper towels, but they have the texture of a woven cloth. And so you don't get those um, that design imprint when you're lifting up color and you're working with watercolors. So definitely Viva paper towels are the way to go. And then uh, last but not least, I have, oh, let me grab a couple of those paper towels off of there. When I get started in a painting session, I always make sure I have several torn off here, ready to go. All right. Um, I always also have some cutoffs here. So you see all these little pieces here. Actually, this one has some watercolor on that side. This is watercolor paper. And the reason I have that sitting right next to me as I'm painting is it's my little tester sheet. It's where I, especially if I'm mixing colors on the go, like in here, I might want to test it real quick before I put it down on my artwork. And so I always have these little sheets next to me. Um, you can see here, I was checking a couple of different pens. Uh, for the nib size and the marks they were going to make. And um, so it's helpful to have some of 
similar paper to what you're going to be using next to you so that you can be sure that you can do some quick tests if you need to. And so that is definitely next to me. All right, we are going to go up over the table and we're going to do our first warm up. I'm so excited. <laughs> can you tell I love to paint? Oh my gosh, I love to paint. <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. And I have water right here. Of course, now some of the water I have with a, a, this is a dropper. I always keep at least one clean water with a dropper so I can add drops to my colors to get the lighter versions of my paints. Let me see if that is in, yep, in the frame. And then I also have a second water and that is for cleaning the brushes so that most of the color goes into that. And um, let's see if you're able to see that one or not. I think you can. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you saw the small palette, and I have the bigger palette here. So I will just, I'm not sure which one we're going to use yet. Um, okay. Let's take this. Let me make sure we're in frame. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Spectacular. Your YouTube live stream is beautiful. Oh, thank you, stay home to shop. <laughs> okay, now here's some washi tape. And I picked this washi tape because it has little hearts on it. So that was in um, homage to the fact that it is Valentine's Day. What's nice about washi tape is it's very um, easy to, oops, sorry about that. We're gonna be doing this one this way. It's very easy to pull off. And what I'm going to do is preserve the edge. Now, why am I taping this down? Because I had mentioned earlier that um, this way it'll keep the paper from bowing the way it did in my other um, in my other notebook. Okay. Plus, when you tear it off, it gives you this beautiful border to your artwork, so you can work all the way to the edges if you like. All right, let's do this. And I bought the washi tape from one of my art peeps on Whatnot. So if you're not on Whatnot yet, but you want to have access to excellent um, art supplies, <laughs> beautiful prices, for instance, with Stay Home to Shop, please follow Stay Home to Shop. He has some great craft type shows and offers fabulous craft items. I've bought a bunch of stuff from him, and so uh, that would be fabulous. Let's see. And also Salmon's Girl. I've bought quite a bit from Salmon's Girl. That's S-A-L-M-O-N-S -S, uh, underscore girl, G-I-R-L. And uh, I've bought some amazing books and things from her. So I definitely encourage you to uh, follow our other whatnot sellers here on whatnot. All right, now I'm folding down the edge so I can get back at it <laughs> later. <laughs> but there we go. So we've got this all taped down and ready to go. I just made sure that the edges were uh, flush with the paper so we don't get bleed underneath there. And let me just make sure that you can see that okay. Oh, that looks like it's perfectly in frame. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do as our warm up is we're going to do a painting like this. So this is, um, a, it's called an ethereal landscape because it's very fuzzy and it doesn't have perfect lines, you know, perfect crisp lines, right? Um, and so I'm going to show you how to get that wishy-washy kind of effect. The first thing that we're going to do is work with tubes for this. All right. So I'm going to take, I picked out a couple of tubes here. One, two. Oh, I'm going to have to have you guys, um, y'all are going to have to help me choose between these two. Hey there, Susie Squeeze. Is that what it is? Susie Quiz? <laughs> Susie Q's? I'm not sure how to say it. <laughs> Welcome in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my tube and while the paper is still dry, 
I'm go and I, I'm going to be creating a horizon line. So you see here the horizon line. So the horizon line generally, most of the time I don't cut it right in the middle. I'm either a little bit below the middle or a little bit above the middle. And um, that is in order to um, use what's called the rule of thirds in art. So it's, um, yes, you'll see artwork that's cut in half, but visually for the eye, it's usually better if it's just below or just above that middle line. So we're gonna put some here. So we're just, it looks a little messy, but trust me, it's gonna be fabulous. So this is a color called Minnesota Pipestone, which is actually a ground up stone that um, is from Minnesota that's used by Native Americans to create um, their pipes, you know, peace pipes. Isn't that cool? Love that. And uh, I love that Daniel Smith uses a lot of stones like that and then creates what they call their Primatech colors. So it says right here, Primatech. And uh, that's one of them, Minnesota Pipestone. It has this very rich uh, red brown. Oh, you know what? I'm already getting paint all over me. <laughs> Let me grab a clean paper towel. All right, the second color is Cascade Brown or Cascade Green by Daniel Smith. And let me show you what that color looks like here. And what I love about this color is it's a it's a granulating color. It separates and it gives you a green and a blue, a green and a blue. So I love that about the Cascade Green. So that's the second color we're going to put down here and I'm squeezing it from the tube. You see how juicy that is in there? Oh my gosh, I just love how juicy these are. So I'm gonna kind of lay this down in other areas here. There we go. And then the third color is going to be either this yellow green or this uh, gamborge yellow, which is a, a, a deep dark yellow. So uh let's see who's first in the chat to uh sound off about which color you'd like to see together with these other two in here i can either go with like a vibrant green or a muted yellow either way i'm watching i'm watching so just if you have a preference shout it out in the chat but these are the two colors we're working with right now and i'm going to put a third color in there so it's either this gamborge or this bright yellow green. Yellow, okay, what is that? Thank you, what is that? <laughs> I love the gamborge, the gamborge yellow, G-A-M-B-O-G-E, gamboge, I guess it is. Um, the gamboge yellow is very warm. It has a very warm feel to it. It's almost like an ochre. An ochre is like dirt. <laughs> Okay, let's put some of this gamboge out there. Of course, I'm making a mess and getting other colors on it. There we go. It's clean. Oh, so beautiful. This is so fun. So just with a couple of tubes like this, and of course you could have a set with the little tubes like this, and you can make tons of paintings with those. Tons of paintings, tons of paintings. Now, this technique of creating this ethereal landscape takes a lot of water lots and lots and lots of water so that's what i was using this big brush for right here and it's still wet from yesterday <laughs> so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this brush and get a bunch of water in it and i'm going to run some water down here in the bottom part of the painting just water fresh water okay and then i'm going to take some water here and I'm going to, so I'm not touching the paint yet, and I'm just running it up here, just above it. Okay, so that gets it nice and wet, and because I have it taped down, it's trying to bow, but it's not bowing very much, which is great. Okay, now instead of using, I can use this brush. Let's go ahead and use this brush. Now I'm going to run it and touch this paint right here. And because this paint is watercolor, it's going to start running, which is awesome.
There we go. So what you're going to start to get is you're going to start to get this paint running down into that water. Now I can see that my table is uh, angled a little bit. So I'm going to lift this up slightly like that and let it run down. So you're going to see these beautiful colors start to separate in there. And if it doesn't run as much as I want it to, I can take water in a spray bottle and I can spray it like this. Now you're starting to see it bloom here, which is okay because I actually want to do that right now is I want to take a brush and pull up some of that color and drip it in there. So what I'm doing now is I'm creating little trees right in the, uh, in the background like that. Let's get some of that red in there and drop that in there. And now I'm also getting bleed up in this way, but these are tree trunks down here. And let's do this right here. And I can actually go like that and then just drop and let it run, 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 run. If I want it to run more in that direction, uh, let's do this first. There's a whole bunch of color down here. I want to sop that up first before I flip it around. There we go. And then I'm going to bring it this direction because I want to get some of that. I want to get some of it to go up in here. And I love when you touch the water that's up above there. So this is like having a little forest in there. And then there's actually a little blob of paint here. I can pick some of it up and come in here. And I'm designing the soft trees there at the surface. Isn't that fun? Oh my gosh, I love doing this. Okay, let's take a little bit more of this paint here and we'll pop it in here a little bit more. If you pick good colors that ha that play nicely together, then you can get, you'll be um, able to have your colors blend together up here and have it be pleasant colors and not muddy. So it helps to have colors that are close to each other on the color wheel. All right. So I think you can see how this has created a little forest up in here. Of course, like I said, if you want it to run more, you can just spray it more with water. And what if I want to put a sky up in here? You see how naturally we have some of the blue separating from the um, that cascade color. But over here, I don't have so much of that. So I'm going to pop a little bit more blue and oh, what color blue do I want to use? <laughs> Let's take a look at Critter Chops colors here. I'm thinking maybe this one, the Smurf Bones up in here. So let's grab Smurf Bones. And what he's done is he writes on the side here. Uh-oh, I'm getting paint all over me. Not unusual. Smurf bones. So he puts on the side what the name of the color is. And so this is a pan instead of it being from a tube. And what I'm going to do is grab some of that paint like this. Now, before I put it directly on my surface, I'm adding a little bit more water to it. And what am I going to do? I'm going to test it out. Oh, okay. That is way too strong straight out of there. So I've got to take my color and put it here and add lots and lots of water because we want it to be very washy, right? Very washy. So now I'm going to just run it along the top here. But I needed it to be super washy, didn't I? And now can you see how the paint is moving around? Right? Coming back down into the trees. That's okay. And I can come here and pick up a little bit more of the gamborge, put the gamborge up in there, put a little more color here of that green. 
So it helps to have that little bit of differentiation here with no paint. You see how you have paint down here and here, but I left that strip with no paint so that that way I can get this, these trees up in here. And you have the clear area right here for those trees. If you didn't do that, then everything would just blend together softly like this and you wouldn't see the little forest developing. Okay, now I'm coming back into areas that are beginning to dry a little bit. So this area here is beginning to dry and I'm pulling some more paint and then defining the trees a little bit better. So is that a fun and quick way that you can <laughs> you can create a landscape just like that. Hey there, uh, Funko lover. Welcome in, welcome in. So what I like to do is as it starts to dry, I go in and add some more detail, some more leaves, maybe broaden the, the base down here. So get a little more definition going. I'll let it dry, I'll look at it, I'll see if there's something more. And then after it's dry, I will come in with my markers. So my micron pens that I show you all all the time and define the forest a little bit better. So um, I'm gonna show you uh, another trick on this one over here for the sky. And then I'll show you, because this is all dry, I can show you what I do with the Micron pen to come in here and uh, define that forest just a little bit more. So we're going to um, set this one aside. What I'm gonna do first is just pick up a little bit more of this excess uh, liquidy paint here. So it'll dry faster. Oh, it's so fun. Remember how I said, if this is like a cloth, then you'll be able to pick up the color without leaving an imprint. If you had another uh, brand that had designs on it, as you try to pick up the color, you'll end up with an imprint there. Okay. Nice. Oh, that was fun, right? Not hard. That is not hard. Any one of you can do that. <laughs> So I encourage you to pick up some tubes because this works well from the tubes. You don't have to do it from the tubes. I've also done it from the pans. Um, this one right here, I did from the pans, from Critter Chops pans. Oop, let me move this out of the way. Move that out of the way. And make sure this is up high enough so that you can see it. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little, um, what I call an ethereal sun or a moon up over here. So we're going to take some color. Now these colors that are in here were the yellow from Critter Chops. If you don't, if you came in a little late, um, I bought a bunch of handmade watercolors from the gentleman on uh, Whatnot who goes by the name Critter Chops, Critter Chops. And uh, these are his handmade watercolors. So um, what I wanna do, those are the, I use the yellow and I use the red that I received from him. And then I use that uh, Minnesota Pipestone is what's in here. That's why I was saying you can also use paint out of uh, these little uh, pans as well to do the same technique. And now what I want to do is put like a glowy little sun up here. So let's get this palette right here. Handcraft love. That's so cool. Oh, thank you. Yes, you need to look at two chats when you're streaming to YouTube. Yes, I have my chat open on uh, YouTube. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> okay. So what I wanna do is I wanna create an orange and I wanna um, make a little sun effect or moon of, yeah, sun, I guess. What I love about this yellow is that it's um, quite bright and good for mixing, like really good for mixing. 
So let's put some yellow. I actually bought three of these yellows because when I color mix, I find I'm color mixing the yellow with reds and the yellow with blues. And I tend to use the yellow up uh, twice as fast. Okay, so that's our yellow in there. And then I'm going to pick up some of the red. So this is the red from the pan. Usually before I start a painting session, I line these all up and I spray them with water so that they'll start to get what I call juicy and uh, the color will begin to release from the pan. All right, so there we go with that. And that should be the red. And let's color mix here and see if we can get a nice fiery orange. Wow. Yep, that was quite a fiery orange. Now, what I want to do, though, is I want to add a lot more water to that. A lot more water, 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 water. And I actually want it to be a little more pink than that. And that's one of the things I noticed about Critter Chops color, Pure Heart. Pure Heart tends more, tends more to be uh, yellowish and have, even though it's red here, that's called the mass tone. So straight out of the little, um, the little half pan, it's quite red. But when you pull the color down, you start to see kind of a yellowish um, tint to it, as opposed to these colors that I have in tubes that tend more toward what we call blue. Uh, and so they have more of that pink, um, or purpley kind of look to them. They don't tend toward the orange and yellow. So let me grab one of those colors to add to this to see if we can uh, punch it up a little bit. So let's see, maybe this one is called Rose Matter. And let's put that in there and that should soften that color up a little bit. This is the color from a tube. This happens to be the Cotman brand. And Cotman is a um, student grade paint from um, Windsor Newton. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, see how that pinkified it a little bit? It's still orange, but it pinkified it. Yep, that's why it's really helpful to have your swatches handy so that you can make choices um, based upon what you see on your swatches. And these are the Critter Chops swatches that I did from the paints I've purchased from him right here on Whatnot. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is with the color in here, let's swatch it first to be sure. That looks good. And it's nice and juicy, there's a lot of water in it. So let's take that and now I'm gonna create a glowy sun slash moon. So actually sun in this case. So I'm gonna make a circle as best I can. Let's make a circle here. What I'm looking for is to get the inside to be a circle. Cause that's gonna be where I'm gonna drop some yellow in later. Okay, so now I'm going to take this and I wanna get a bunch more water in it. So, oh, I don't want to get all that color in there. Let's clean it out. I'm putting it first in my dirty water. <laughs> and then I'll uh, go into my clean water. I'm going to get most of the color out of it before I go into my clean water. So now I've got clean water on there. I'm cleaning off the ferrule. This area is called the ferrule right there where the metal is. And oftentimes when you're mixing your color i mean when you're washing out in your water a lot of times water will sit on your ferrule and when you go to use your brush it'll drip off onto your artwork you don't want that so that's why i always have a paper towel in my hand and you'll see me doing this a lot cleaning off that ferrule now with lots of lots of water in the brush just water i'm going to pull this out and this will create a very soft, uh, very moody sort of background with the majority of your color right here around 
what would be the sun. Isn't that fun? All right, now, what I'll need to do though, <laughs> is I will need to wait until that dries. Now, with this kind of paint, you can use a heat gun, okay? So I could sit here and take a heat gun and put that on there and have it begin to dry. And then once it dries, then and only then will I go in with the yellow because I want to pop the yellow sort of right in the center of that sun. But I don't, right now, if I pop the yellow in there, what's going to happen is it's going to run. It's going to grab this, uh, this wetness around here and the capillary action is going to pull it out which is exactly the action that we used here to get all of this to run. But with that little bit of the sun there, I, like a setting sun, I don't want it to run. So I'm gonna set this aside. We'll do something else and we'll come back and pop the yellow into that a little bit later. But that's how you can create that sort of moody sky, like a sunset sky. Oh, so fun. Now, um, that is, for that part, but now I wanted to show you using a micron pen to work back into the dry part. So I've got dry trees here, right? And um, I did this painting last night. So I'm going to take my pen. The micron pen is a permanent pen. Um, there are other brands of pens too. Faber-Castell has their brand as well. Uh, my favorite to work with are these Sakura Pigma Microns. And now I can go in here and I can play around with these trees. So just using the tip and I'm holding it lightly like this, not like a pencil. You can hold it like a pencil, but I find it's a little looser if I hold it a little more loosely in my hand. And then I can just come in here and create little just little leaves. I can sort of define the leaves a little bit. Isn't that fun? And I can put a little bird in the picture if I wanted to. But I love doing this. I love coming in and sort of defining the tree in a very loose manner. And the, the fact that it is loose lends itself to this type of painting anyway, because the whole painting is actually quite loose. And then if I wanted to, I can bring the, I can define the tree a little bit here. I can come in and define the roots if I wanna play around with that, give you almost a tree of life kind of feel to it. See, I'm not, I'm holding this very um, gently and I'm not touching the whole time. I'm letting it skip. That's called broken color or broken line. And uh, so that way you are able to define the trees and have a little fun. Do a little drawing while you're at it. I like to draw a little bit onto the trees like that. And uh, so then I'm going to take something that's very wishy-washy and I'm going to turn it into something with a little more definition to it just by using my pen. Has anyone else in the chat done that before where you uh, just lay down some color and then come back in with a pen to define it? I just, I love that. Because <laughs> to me, for me, painting is just all about uh, a mood and a feel and the color. And then, um, I can come back in later to get that, um, you know, the, the uh, design element into it. Let's see how dry this is. This is most of the way dry. Let me hit it just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Oops, there we go. Just a little. All right, and then, Let's take a little bit of that yellow. Now I'm not gonna use this big brush again for the yellow because I could, because it does come to a nice tip right there, but I'm gonna to choose to use a, a much smaller brush in order to be a little more precise there. So we're just gonna pick up a little bit of this yellow. 
again, I want the yellow to be very wishy-washy. I don't want the yellow to be um, too bright. So I'm going to use my spare watercolor paper here. And I can actually add more water to it right here and make sure that I'm picking up a very washy version of it. So I'm just going to come in here. Very light, very, very light yellow that way. I prefer to go a little bit lighter. And then if I decide that I want to come in and make it more yellow later, a little darker yellow, I can. <laughs> You're better off painting it lighter and then coming in and adding. Now I'm just going to add, you know how sometimes when the sun's setting, you get like this really cool line that comes off the sun. So with that little bit of yellow there, I'm just going to, you have to be purposeful. Don't go back and forth and rework it. Just make your line like that. And then this one like that there. So that's sort of the, the flash that you get as the sun is setting. There you go. All right. Woo. Love that. Love it, love it, love it. Simple, simple dimple, and yet very effective. Now, this is a 9 by 12, and what I'm going to end up doing with this is cutting it in half and then using a mat. Look at this. Let me find my mats. So let's get this black mat. The black mat might work better with that. And the black mat will come in here. And then the piece of artwork will look something like that when it's finished. Actually, I probably want to bring it down like that. So it'll be something like that. It'll have a really neat um, look of like safari land, right? Woo! All right. So that's how you do a simple wishy-washy. You can see here how this one's beginning to dry and we can start to see the tree definition. There's a little bit of that uh, paint that came out of the tube that's left there. I could use water and pick some of that up and work back into here and redefine the trees. And so that's what I'll be doing. Now there's a little speck of dust there. I find it's super hard. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard, but you have to leave it. <laughs> you have to leave it, let the whole thing dry and then brush it off because if you try to brush it off while it's still wet, you can make marks in the wishy-washiness of the paint, and then that messes it up. Um, I wanna show you here also, see the granulation that's in here? Isn't that cool? I love that granulation. Oh, okay. So now we're going to do a painting similar to this right here. And that is, um, I'm gonna use the watercolor block for that. Oop, come here watercolor block. So this is the block that is glued on all of the sides. There's a little bit of dirt on there, but you know what? I am not gonna worry about it. Um, by dirt, I mean there are little spots on there. Remember this is glued in. So I can't, if I take it off, that will um, get rid of the beauty of it being on um, on a block to prevent it from bowing. And um, the nice thing also about a block is you can work all the way to the edges as opposed to having it taped down. Although some people even on a block will put tape on it so that they can preserve the white edges. Um, but I'm not gonna do that. Now, you see the variations of the mountains here? What I'm going to do is use the watercolor pencil that we talked about earlier. And I'm gonna sketch in my mountain scene. Oops, let's move this out of here because uh, I'm afraid that's gonna end up, <laughs> end up in our painting here. Okay, so um, I am going to draw in a few mountains here and then we're going to <coughs> pick the colors that we wanna use in order to get the diffuse look of the Smoky Mountains. Uh, my daughter was born, I mean, my daughter was uh, married up in Asheville, North Carolina in the Smoky Mountains. And it's amazing, not the Smoky Mountains, is that what it's called? No, Blue Ridge Mountains. And so that's what, um, it's like, they look like that. 
it's amazing. Um, so what I'm going to do is using the light blue here and the light green for the ones in the foreground, I'm going to just lightly sketch on this paper using that as a guide. So I like to have a guide. I usually will use a piece of artwork or I'll use um, a photograph, maybe a photograph that I've taken as a guide. The neat thing about these particular watercolor pencils is um, they're stead letter and they are triangular in shape so they don't roll off of your work surface. They're pretty cool. Um, okay, so the background here is going to be the blue. Blues and purples. Actually, do I have a purple? I have like uh, this right here. So let's start with a uh, just a blue one back here. There's going to be sky up here. So I'm going to bring it and the nice thing about this too is because this is a pencil, you are able to um, erase it if you put it somewhere and then you decide that you didn't want it there. Um, okay, so that's the one side. And then here, it may be hard to see because I'm using it very lightly and I'm just barely getting my, um, my line in there. Okay, so we have one mountain here, another one coming over here. And then uh, I'm actually going to, some people are like, don't erase. But yeah, I do erase. I think it's okay. It's okay to erase. Um, let's do something like maybe some purple are going to come in here. And let's do one that goes like this. And then it's going to have a peak there. Okay. So you're going to design your back to your front like this. Actually, I'm going to do this. See how nice it is to just gently and lightly use a pencil. This is a Prismacolor eraser. So it works really well with colored pencils. And then we're going to bring this up like this. So we've got these sort of rolling hills. What I'm trying not to do is to put too much directly in the center. You want to try to stay away from that center and have things um, merge on either one side or the other side. It looks better. So this is um, the magenta color. So it'll blend right in with various kinds of purples. All right, this side's gonna need to go up a little bit more. So you get to see the full process here, right? <laughs> there we go, like that. And then we'll go back to the blues again. And now we're gonna have, as they get closer, here they're going to be skinnier, and as they get closer, they're going to be wider. So let's give more space to this one right here. And then, so we're going to go here. And I want this to have more of a peak to it. They don't all just roll. Sometimes they have a little bit of a peak. And then over here, this line ends here. So this is going to be a pretty good sized mountain coming up like this. All right. And then we're going to go to the greens. So as we get closer to the front, we're getting, you're going to start to see the greens. The atmosphere of the sky is no longer um, muting out those colors and turning them uh, blue. Okay, let's bring this this way a little bit more. And then we'll do more of a rolling green hill. Like that. And then over here. So I've got my blue, purple. I threw a little bit more blue in there. And now we're going to do green. Now, um, in this, there's a little bit of a water feature down here. Super light. So I'm going to put that little river in here. 
and I actually need another like this continues up like that. So we're going to put in a river over here. Hello, Emily does golf. Welcome in. Welcome in. I'm showing you how I do watercolor, how I work with watercolors to get a, what I call ethereal landscapes. So that's landscapes that have a very uh, airy feel to them. All right. And the other half of that water. So we're going to bring the water in from here. So it looks like a meandering river right there. So this is going to end up being blue. If you wanted to, you could like this put the watercolor pencil in there because once we hit this with water, it does become watercolor. So as you're working with it, if you need to define it a little bit better, feel free to use your um, watercolor pencil to lay in some color. All right, and then we're gonna do another green one here. And it's gonna go here. There. And so that sort of comes in as a valley. That means that your eye is going to be drawn to this area down here, um, as well as because the eye will be drawn to this little valley right here. Then when I'm working in this area of the painting, I want to put my uh, sun feature. So do you see the sun there, the soft diffuse sun? I want to put the sun feature up here so that your eye travels across the page like this. If I put the sun right here where there's a dip, what's going to happen is your, your eye is going to stay on this side of the page and it's not going to travel all around the painting. So you have to consider elements of design as you're uh, designing your um, artworks. All right, so I like to, uh, for this, start with this yellow, well, start with the yellow and the pink, let it dry, and then drop a little bit of blue in there. So let's do the yellow and the pink first. Uh, the reason I'm doing the yellow and the pink first is because if I do the blue first and then I put some yellow here, if the yellow touches the blue, it'll turn green and we don't want green in our sky, right? No, nope, no green in the sky. The green's supposed to be down here. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead. I'm just gonna dampen the paper a little bit in this area because I'm gonna want the paints to flow. So I'm using my spray bottle and I'm just spraying a little bit up here. I don't want it too wet. I just want it a little bit damp so that I get some good flow. All right, oh, there's a little hair in there. Let's take care of that. All right, so now the paper is damp up here and I'm going to go in with Critter Chops. So I'm gonna go in with the yellow from Critter Chops. Critter Chops is, if you weren't here earlier, Critter Chops is on Whatnot and he makes his own paint. So these are the colors of paint that he has made and I'm working with his yellow right now. So we've got the yellow. I'm gonna use my big brush like this. I know there's like bluish green. You know what? I am gonna set this green aside and I have another empty cup here just in case I need more water. So let's get a little bit more water here. I always keep a jug of water next to the, because I don't have a sink in my art studio and so I have to go to a sink and it's just easier to have a jug of water and extra cups here, right? <laughs> to be prepared. All right, um, so now I'm going to pick up some of this yellow. Again, this is a very bold yellow. I don't want it that bold. I want something more diffused. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use, this is scratch paper. So this is just watercolor paper. 
and I'm going to deposit the color. You see how bold that color is? I don't want it bold like that when I go onto a diffused background. So I'm going to keep adding water until I get it more diffused like this. Now, the neat thing about watercolor is you can re-wet watercolor and pick it up. So if you're putting it on uh, another piece of watercolor like this, watercolor paper, I can come back in later and pick up more of that color if what I'm looking for is a nice diffused color. Okay, so I'm gonna want my sun effect in here. So I'm just, I'm following the line that I put in with the pencil. And I'm just putting in a setting sun effect. All right, now I'm gonna add a little bit of this, uh, this red that I made earlier. And the red I made earlier, this is a combination of a tube paint as well as the pan from Critter Chops. So it gives me a sort of diffused sunset color. So I've got some yellow on my brush and then I'm gonna combine it with a little bit of this. You know how you get that pop of orange when the sun is setting, right? And I actually want it to be a little more pink. So I'm just gonna keep the orange right here next to the sun. And then I'm gonna grab a little bit of pink, a bit more pink in here. Actually, the nice thing is that the, um, the pink is separating a little bit in there. And you see, sometimes when you've color mixed paints, as you apply them, they can, uh, the color can separate a little bit. All right, this is a little bit more of the Rose Matter Hue from Cotman. I'm putting it in this little palette dish. But you can use any dish. I buy plates from over at the uh, my thrift store for 25 cents. And then I have a ceramic plate to use. You just don't want the plate to have anything on it, you know, like no design. There we go. So now this is a little more pink, but it's a subdued pink. If you have a color that says matter, M-A-D-D-E-R, that's a very earthy color. And so that earthy color um, is really nice when you want something that's a little more, a little sort of subdued. So this orange, orangey color is beginning to dry, but as long as I have plenty of water on my brush here, I can get it to blend the edges. Even if it is dry, I can get the edges to blend. So this is a beautiful pinky purpley sunset. And I'm leaving a little bit of area here because the further from the sun you get, you get a little bit of blue pop in there. Um, usually, usually this pinky red is higher up in the um, atmosphere and you'll end up with blues right next to your mountains. So that's why here I left a little bit of space and here I left a little bit of space so that we can pop some blue in there when we get ready to do the sky right there. All right. There we go. If I was really living dangerously, I would throw some purple in there, but uh, I'll just wait and throw some blue in there in a little bit. But you see how I was able to pick up my, even though I had excess color, if you don't have a palette handy like that, just use another piece of watercolor paper to put your color on and then adjust your colors um, right on here, just using that watercolor paper as your palette, if you don't have a palette handy. All right. Ooh. Let's go ahead now, and we don't want to work on this mountain yet, or this mountain yet, because they're close to this area, and if I touch the yellow, or I touch the orange and pink, all of a sudden it's going to pop up and bleed into there. Just like when earlier we were doing this and we added color and then the color just picked right up and started to bleed. That's what will happen here if these touch. 
So we want to leave this area to dry. Or of course, if you hate to wait, you could just hit it with a heat gun. <laughs> All right. So let's get down into some of these blues. Let's get into some blues. So um, let's see. This is going to be very light, very light. And then we're going to get a little purpley here. So I'm going to... Um, if you see in here, we have light blue, light blue, and then we start getting a little purple. Of course, this is your painting, so you could do all kinds of wacky. <laughs> you don't have to follow along with, uh, you know, with the precepts of um, what the actual landscape looks like. You can go ahead and just be crazy. Um there's a color here made by Critter Chops called Blurple. So you see how it's a purple and a blue together. And um, so what I want to do is grab that and put lots of water in it. Lots and lots and lots of water. So let's get the Blurple. That, I keep sticking my fingers in these. I need to buy a, um, a palette. You can get pallets that they will pop in. These little half pans will pop into. And uh, that way you don't keep sticking your fingers in it like I am right now. <laughs> so let's find Blurple. There's Blurple. Now, of course, I don't want to mix it on here. I'm going to move that aside for a moment. And I'm going to come into here. So let's get some of the Blurple. I don't need much, just a little bit because it's quite a... Um, quite a strong color, right? And I'm going to want to add lots of water to that. That's the trick with watercolor. It's called watercolor because water is the that main ingredient that moves that all around. So this blurple has a kind of a purple color, which I love that. Now, I don't want it contaminating other wells here because I want to be able to uh, put other colors in there. So this has lots of water in it. Like I said, you're better off going light and then coming back and adding more color if you need to darken. So let's do this right here. And I am going to work on this mountain right here. So I have my lines that I put in with the watercolor uh, pencil. So at first, I just fill the space like this. Let's go ahead, fill the space. Of course, if I needed to adjust the color like it was too light or too dark for my liking at that moment, I could do that. And what I'm going to do is just put the color all in there. Now remember, I can come back after we're done with watercolor pencil and I'll define this edge with a watercolor pencil. Okay, now that's more or less very even in tone, right? And I don't want it to be even in tone. I actually want it to be a little bit lighter down in here. So I'm going to take my brush with just water in it. And I'm going to come along the edge here. And I'm going to use water and pick up some of that color. So what that's going to do is it'll give us a hazy look in that area. Right down here. There we go. So we want color there, but we want it to be a little bit subdued. And have it look more misty there along the bottom. I'm seeing that my paper has had some uh, some wear to it because this has been around the block. It got moved. And so there are little areas of the paper where the color is sticking. But no worries. This is our artwork. Okay. So now what you've got is a little bit of whiteness down here, a little bit whiter. You're getting more of the white of the paper. Plus you get a really cool bleed. You see where it's starting to bleed right here? Now what I wanna do is this part's dry. I wanna drop just a little more color in here at the 
the top edge. And I might want to do this to give it the more the feel of a mountain. So you can build up your layers of color little by little by little like this, just by layering. And so I'm going to define that mountain like this, just by adding little bits. Okay, so you get a little bit of variation in that. Okay, so that's our first purple. Now I'm going to put purple and some blue together. So let's take a little bit of that Smurf Bones that we used earlier. And I'm just going to barely get any of that. Not enough. <laughs> I want to be sure that I have, okay. So now what I've got is a little bit bluer version of that purple, right? But it's a combination of the Smurf Bones and Blurple from Critter Chops. So I like to work back and forth between the colors that, um, like I like to mix colors from colors that I'm already using. So let's take this one and put it in here. I may need to make it a little bit more purple. But the nice thing is you can, like this is the first layer. You can actually sit there and work into it and work into it and just this little card that I made, I probably spent about two hours on it. That going back and forth, push and pull, push and pull. Add a little more color right <laughs> now there's a little bleed going on here and i am not mad about that i think that's great okay let's uh, grab a little bit more of that and bring the color so i'm just making sure that i cover that whole area right now and then i'm going to come in and i'm going to remove some of the color Actually, there was a little tiny dot of pink in there, and I like that. I'm going to pick up a little bit of that pink. Why? Because there's pink in the sky. So what's going to happen? That pink in the sky is going to affect the mountain, right? So it's okay to layer different colors in there like that. Actually, I think I'll do that over here as well. I'll lay a little bit of that pink just to give it some little bit of interest so that the tops of the peaks here, the top areas are going to have some of that pink on them, isn't it? Aren't they? There you go. And then what do we want? We want to get that white in here. So I'm going to just with water come in here and start lifting. Now, what some people do is they'll take their actual paper towel and go in, make sure your area is clean, and then lift some of that paint like that. Uh, that makes me nervous <laughs> because how many times have I done this? And then I get a different color from somewhere on the paper towel. I get a different color in there and um, then I'm annoyed. So I'd usually just use water like this to make that bottom area misty like this and then I wipe it off here so if I'm picking up color I'm wiping it on my paper towel instead of bringing the paper towel to the surface watching for questions hey there live sharks welcome in welcome in and Avery appreciate you being here we're also live on YouTube so if there's anyone on YouTube, ooh, for some reason my phone, uh, come on, there we go. I'm just watching for chats over on YouTube. And uh, all right, no chats on YouTube, it looks like. There we go. And uh, huh, everything looks good on YouTube. Yeah, I can see, I can see. For some reason, my phone got stuck. But it says I am live. Hold on one second. I'm going to make sure. Technology. 
I want to be all the way. Yep, it's alive. There we go. All right. So this color, not much of the color is coming back out of the white, which tells me that this color is very staining. So every time you do a painting, you're learning more about your... Uh, <laughs> about your pigments. And so the color appears to be rather staining and so it's not lifting very well here. There are a couple of ways to um, resolve that. One is before using the color, which in this case, it's probably the Smurf bones that is quite, um, is quite staining because if you look over here in the purple area, I was able to lift quite a bit of that out. So I expect the blurp, the Smurf bones is the one that is a very staining color. So in the future, if there's an area I know I'm going to be putting Smurf bones and I want to lift color back out, I can use a medium. It's a watercolor medium that's a lift preparation. And you can put that down on your paper and it will help the paints to lift better. But, you know, that's getting rather technical, and that's if you're really into watercolor, you might uh, you might want to use that. I have it, but I've never used it. <laughs> All right. So, yes, we got some of that blue out of there, but what I need to do now is I need to darken this area a little bit more because the white, it, it'll look, this will look lighter against the darker up here. So let's drop in a little bit more of that color. So when you bring that color in the second or the third time, what's going to happen is it will, by layering it, it will darken it. Okay. Of course, you can always go back and uh, mix a little bit more color. But I try to mix enough here that it will all have enough to layer. Okay, that's better. Now remember, don't worry too much about these edges because we're going to come back in with the pencil and um, make sure that those areas are nice and defined. Okay. Now, let's come down into this area. We're going to get darker now that we're coming down in here. Let's get darker. So I like this, um, this true blue and the skylight. I think I'll start with the skylight and then go to true blue. So let's start with skylight here. So let's get some of that paint up there. There we go. Skylight. I want to put make sure I have plenty in there. And now I'm going to add lots of water. That's our skylight color from Critter Chops on Whatnot. He makes his own paint. So if you haven't been in here uh, before or earlier, I purchased these paints from Critter Chops here on Whatnot. Okay. So I'm not seeing enough of a difference between this mountain and this mountain. So I'm going to make sure that I have a little more of the color in there. There we go. So it's a little bit, a little bit heavier color. And what am I doing? I'm following along the line that I made earlier with my watercolor pencil. So now I'm going to add some water and then start to bring the color down. There we go. And now we can just fill in this space. And then I will bring some more water. Bring a little bit more water into the, oops, hold on, I need my paper towel. A little bit more water into this bottom area here so we can get it a little misty. Now it looks a little bit light up here to me, so I'll probably darken that just a little bit more. There we go. Let's get those, that mist going. There we go. So that's a little bit lighter, and then I can blend into there a little bit of the darker. And we'll bring that in there. And since we're doing another coat, 
over top of that, it will darken it even a little bit more. There we go. And then let's get a little bit of the rolling hill feature going here. Now what I'm doing right now is I'm pouncing my brush like this. So sometimes I find I'm able to get the color right where I want it by stippling it. That's going up and pouncing up and down. Okay, let's go a lot darker right here. And what I actually want to do is I want to do a combination of blue and green right in here. So let's get um, the true blue I said was going to be the next blue. So let's take some of the true blue and put it in here. Wow, yeah, we're starting to get sort of that peacock color going. And then I wanna add a little bit of green to that. So where's the cascade? Let me check here. I had a tube of cascade. Yes, so this is the Daniel Smith cascade and it's cool cause it's a green blue combo. So I'm gonna put just a little bit of it in there so that we can um, blend those two together. There, so it's, it's blue, but it's got a lot of green to it, doesn't it? There we go. So we're wanting this color that's closer to us to be bolder, right? And then adding a lot of water so we can feather that get a little bit lighter down here. I'm feathering, I'm going along that edge in order to get rid of the line. Okay, we'll bring the color down like this. And then make sure we have lots of water for this bottom area here. Lots of water so we can lift Lift, lift, lift. So we're lifting some of that color out. There we go. Nice. Now what you're going to notice here is you have that play between the blue and the green. Oh, I just love that. Okay. And it looks like we're going to need a little bit more of the skylight because we need to darken that just a little bit. Skylight. We need to darken the edges here. So you want to have a gradient where you have the darkest up here. The darkest up here, and then it goes gradient down to very light. All right. And then this one was uh, blurple. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Not that much blurple. <laughs> Let's put some over here. Wow. Blurple is strong, y'all. Strong. Hey, whiz. Okay. Oh, and that's a color from uh, Critter Chops. So let's do this. Get that out of there. So that was a combo of blurple and Smurf bones. And in this case, I want to add lots of water. Lots of water. And then I'm going to come back in here. Right. There we go. So you see how you start out light and then you can come in and just define it, define it, define it a little bit more. There we go. So I don't want too much down here. I want to have the uh, mistiness, the mistiness. There we go. I might bring just a little bit more of it in there. More water. More water. I don't want to put too much color in there. I want to leave that misty. Okay. And then this one was that blurple for the most part. So I'm going to deepen this just a little bit more with the blurple.
layer, layer, layer till you get the results that you want. And push and pull, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out. There we go. So now we're beginning to get that gradient where you see the darker up here and the lighter down at the bottom. Oh, hello, hello. I see a whole bunch of paper and crate and Red Rock Creations. Welcome in, welcome in. All right. So now let's go much more green right here. And we want a deep green in here. So let's see, let's see. We're going to use the green from Critter Chops. And, oh, see how I got a little bit of green in there? Remember I told you I always end up getting, like, paint everywhere? <laughs> no problem. Remember we have the Willow's Blender, which is kind of stiff on the end. This is exactly what I use. Now you want a totally clean part of your paper towel. You lift the color up. And then you go in with your Willow's Blender and you blend it out. So you can see there, there's barely anything left. And when I put the blue over top of that, you won't even notice it. So I'm glad that happened so that you could see what I do in order to um, get out a little error like that. Okay, let's push this up a little bit because I realize I'm getting further and further and further down. Here, I want to be sure you can see it on the paper. A little dusty, dusty particles there. Okay, so now we're going to go in with uh, this green, but I I want to take this green, which looks very much like a spring green, and I want to add. Remember, I said you're you're pushing and pulling and using your various colors together. So I'm going to take some of the cascade. And I'm going to add it in here with this green because the green by itself is very light. And I want it to play well with the other colors. So I just, oh, nice and dark, nice and dark. Yes. But even though it's dark, it speaks well to these other colors because it actually has a combination of that spring green and this color in it. Hey, ooh, looky there. Now, before I start pulling it down, I'm going to add more water so that I can get a very uh, muted gradient here, right? Just keep adding more water. Add more water. Add more water to the bottom. What I like about the Cascade color from Daniel Smith is the way it granulates so the colors separate out and i love that <laughs> isn't that nice oh that's a beautiful color of green okay and what i'm going to do then is use a little bit of water to pull a little bit more of this out more pull more color out so i get the mist let's get some mist now when i Put this video up on YouTube when I um, when I edit the video to put up on YouTube. Sometimes some of this um, talk will be removed, and I'll just speed it up so it'll go a little faster. If you're watching the replay, all right. Now, I really like the depth of color right here. I want to get a little bit more of this cascade going up in here, right? You see how we put down a layer and then we have to come back in and we have to um, intensify it. So that's what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to come back in here and intensify this a little bit more. So we've got more of the color here. Oh, yeah. This is kind of that blue green look to it. And yes, sometimes I do turn my page. Some watercolor purists are like, you have to do it all from the same angle. Otherwise, the the strokes don't look right. I'm like, nah, not my jam. I turn my, I turn my work all the time because especially doing a lot of abstract and uh, mixed media type work, I find that it helps a lot if you turn your artwork and then start working from a different angle. 
Okay, awesome. There we go. So that intensified that part of the mountain right there. And I can see right here, we have nice separation here, here, and here. This one looks a little too monotone, right? A little too monotone. So that is, a, is this combination of Smurf bones and um, Blurple. So let's get some of that. And we're going to darken this a little bit more. So this is adding in order to get a little more contrast. When I was in art school in drawing class, our teacher used to, well, for me in particular, she was like, more contrast. She was always telling me to put in more contrast. So as I build a watercolor painting, I'm looking for, okay, is there enough contrast in there? It's okay to have gradients, but at the same time, you want to uh, work with your contrast. Okay, that's much better, much better there. And I want a little bit more purple in there, but, you know, I don't want it to be like crazy like that. I want to be sure that it's watered down. So I'm going to put just a little bit more purple toward the tops here. And then this is where I can sort of define this mountain a little bit. There we go. Now, I don't like that being, uh, with this being all soft and this being a little bit uh, graphic. So I'm going to soften those edges, right? <laughs> all about softening the edges. All right. There you go. So now we've got a good gradient there, here, 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 here. This one actually turned out with a good gradient already. Here, this is too consistent. You see that? Where it's consistent all the way across? I don't like that. I want to, um, I want to make it a little bit more, a um, little more interest there. So I'm just grabbing a little bit more of this true blue which to me almost has a peacock blue kind of look to it. And then I'm going to pop in here and see if I can intensify what's up here a little bit more. Just so we get a little variation in that mountain. There we go. So we'll see how that, we'll see how that dries. All right. And... Now, before I do the bottom part here, I'm going to come up here, all right, because this is still a little bit wet and this is still a little bit wet. Oh, actually, I'm going to put the water feature in right here. So let's see what color we want for the water feature. Uh, I'm thinking Fusite. So this is a Daniel Smith color. It's actually a stone, Fusite stone. And um, it just has this beautiful crystalline, it actually sparkles, but it's literally ground up stone. It's one of those prim Primatech colors. And um, let's get this going in here and see if we can combine this with one of the blues and um, create a really neat sort of sparkly river effect there. But I wouldn't want to use it just by itself because... It needs to play nicely with these other colors. It needs to speak to the other colors. Um, so I'm going to need to pull some of one of these other colors into it, some of the blue, in order that the resulting color will speak to the other colors that are here. Okay, I want it to be a kind of almost a sparkly ribbon. Okay, and we're going to pull just a tiny bit of yin min blue in with it. And then let's put that in there. So remember, I have some of the, um, the pencil that I put down earlier as well, some of the watercolor pencil. Okay, here we go. That's a pretty watercolor, fe I mean, water, uh, like river feature right there. Now, what I can do as well is after that dries, I can pop in some of the sparkle watercolor. 
the shimmer watercolors that I mentioned earlier because that will give the river a sparkle. There we go. And so these were the shimmer watercolors here. Oops, there you go, like that. And so that will lend some sparkle, some more sparkle to that area of the fuchsite. Okay, let's go back up to here. We want these to be super light blue, super light blue. So let me look at my colors here and see what I want to use for that. Now, I'm looking here and I don't know, I just used a whole bunch of those. So I may want to go here. These are tube paints. These were the pans from Critter Chops and these are various tubes. So I'm feeling more like this manganese blue for up in here is gonna give the feel that it's more pushed back into um, the background. So this is the Utrecht version of manganese blue. And let's put a little bit of it out here. Oops, there's a lot of gum Arabic that just came out with that. These are, um, watercolors are pigments that are mixed together with a base, in this case, gum Arabic. Hey, Red Rock Creations. Red Rock Creations says, hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome in. So um, the it's the pigment together with the um, gum Arabic and maybe other things as well to hold the pigment in suspension. And so what's happening is that uh, when I just squeezed a little bit out, a lot of the filler, not filler, but a lot of the carrier came out. Um, together with it. Now you see how bold that is? That's going to be way too bold for this. So I'm going to have to add lots of water and really, really work with it. So let's, I just put lots of water in my brush. Let's do this. Wow. It's still too dang blue, too dark, too dark. I can just add a little bit of water to it to uh, lighten it up, lighten it up, lighten it up. Let's do this. Like I said, we don't want the blue touching the yellow because it will color mix and turn into what? Green. I don't want green in my sky. No, no, no. Now, manganese is a staining color, so I'm being careful not to put too much of it down here and really bring some water in there to gently blend it into that area. Okay. And then lift, 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 lift. I want some color, but I want it to, I need it to lift so it's not, it doesn't stain too much. There we go. And then let's go in here. You see, I can, because it's watercolor, I can soften those edges with a little bit of water. There we are. That's better. I just want to barely any. Now, I don't know why a tiny bit of it came here, but I will use my blender brush, my Willow's blender, right? So I'm lifting a bunch of that color right back out. There we go. And then I don't know where that came from, but I'm going to get most of the water out of the blender here. And then let's come in here, turn it around. And then it looks distinctly green. So I don't know whether it's because I was working with the green there or whether a little bit of that blue bled up into the yellow, but we want to scrub that out, don't we? While I'm thinking of it. Now what happens sometimes is as you're scrubbing, sometimes the paper will begin to pill and that's what's happening here. So I'm going to leave it 
And what I'll actually do is I'll put some trees along that line and then it'll just become part of the feature of the painting. <laughs> because it's green up there and I don't want to, the paper's beginning to pill. And so I don't want the paper to pill too much in that area. All right. So another way that you can fix that is to add a little bit of Chinese white. So let me see where my Chinese white is. Oh, did I not put it out here? Yes. So this is a little bit of Chinese white. And Chinese white doesn't cover everything. But every so often you can take a teeny tiny little brush. Oh, let me find a teeny tiny little brush. Okay, there's a little brush. And I'm going to get it wet first. So I have a whole, um, a whole little bin that's just full of these tiny little brushes. So Chinese white will not necessarily cover it, but let's see if we can soften that little bit of green that's there. And it might take two layers to soften it and then go back over it with um, white as well. I mean, uh, uh, yellow as well. So that's the thing. Chinese white is not like, it's not going to bring you back to the white of the paper. But it does help a little bit. Okay. It all depends on how much of a perfectionist you are. <laughs> Okay, let's put the top back on the white. You can also use white gouache, which is opaque watercolor, and do the same thing. So let's not play with that too much because that's what messes up. That can mess up the yellow. Um, okay, and then we're going to do another mountain over here. So let's do a combination of this cobalt together with what are we going to do? What are we going to do over here? that over here. So this was the sky blue right here. So we get sort of a comment and this should be, this one in the background should be the lightest of the lights. Although the sky should be very light as well. Okay, there we go. Nice. Let's bring that in there. I like you, like you, like you. That's like a hint, a hint of a mountain back here. Okay. Darken it up a little bit, bring it down a little bit more, and then let's get some more water. Oops, I'm knocking things over. Okay. And then. I want to lighten up this bottom area a little bit, just a little bit. So I get some differentiation between here. Okay. Lighten that. Let's take a little bit more color and drop it in here to darken the edge a little bit more. There you go. So that gives you an idea of that. Let's come back down here now. See, I don't want to drop in this sky yet either. I don't want to drop in that sky until these two are dry. So there's a lot of dry, not dry, dry, not dry there, right? <laughs> okay. So let's come back down into here. And um, I'm going to use a tube green. It's called Hooker's Green, and that's a typical color used by landscape artists. It's um, because you, it's a nice rich green. Let's see if I can get any out of the tube here or not. As you can see, it's well used. Okay, it's having trouble coming out, but we will just reach in there and get some of it. Let's see how practical that is. Even once it's dry in the tube, you can still activate it with water. Let me see there. Wow. Okay, that sucker's bright. 
bright and beautiful. And now what I want to do, though, is I want to um, make it play nice with the other colors. So what am I going to do? I'm going to grab some of this Cascade Green and mix the two together. All right. So let's go ahead and drop that in here. Wow. It's nice and dark, which is great. There we are. So let's add some water now. Start feathering out those edges. All right. Feather, feather, feather. So the more you work it, the more you can activate it. All right. Scrubby, scrubby. I'm scrubbing to get rid of the little line from the first bit that I put in there. And actually, as the paint, as it comes closer to us, the color actually becomes more bold, more saturated right next to the front. It's okay to have some uh, fade in here, but the part right next to you should be uh, a little bit more bold. All right, let's get some of that color up there. There we go. Now what I want to do is as this river goes back into there, this just right along the river bank should be a little bit lighter. Heading back into here. So I'm going to lift just a little bit of that. And I'm going to use just the edge here. And then what I want to do is grab a little bit of that green and sort of bring it down like this to intensify that just a little bit. Let's intensify it. Intensify. There we go. All right. Nice. So now you can see all the various layers going back. Now this one right here should be just a little bit lighter than this. So let's mix these, but I'm gonna get a little crazy and bring some of this in. All right, so it's still green, but it is further back. There we go. Thank you to everybody who's joining me this evening. I hope you're enjoying this painting lesson. All right, so let's see here. So this should be a lighter version of this. I want to get a little bit of this to be lighter, 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 lighter. In there. Get this part right here to be lighter. I'm going to take an edge where there's no other paint, pick it up a little bit. There we go. And then darken, let's darken this area right here. Or there we go. Darken it, darken it, darken it. Dark and lighten, dark and lighten. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So now you've got some real gradation going there. Oh, from the kind of the purpley back mountains to the blue front mountains to starting to put some green in there to a really bright green right here. So let's uh, 
put the sky in right here and right here. So for the sky, uh, I'm looking to see, I really like, you see the granulation here? The granulation means the way that it separates. It's not smooth and even as it dries like this. It has a little bit of uh, movement to it. So this is cerulean blue. And this one happens to be Windsor and Newton brand. So let's take a little bit of that. Just a little bit. There. Believe it or not, just a tiny bit like that. That's probably even too much. <laughs> so again, that's Cerulean Blue by Windsor and Newton. And let's add a little bit of water to that. And then I'm mixing it in with the um, Fuchsite, which has a little bit of sparkle to it. Yes, let's get a little sparkle going. Okay, plenty of water because I want it to be nice and light. So we're just going to drop in a little bit of blue sky here. Now you have to be careful with blue sky and orange sky because blue and orange are opposite each other on the color wheel. So when blue and orange overlap, they create a bit of a brown look to it. And we don't want brown in our sky, do we? So that's why I left a little bit of white to be sure that I can just barely bring it in here. And I'm not creating a uh, muddy look there. And I actually want to pick it up. A lot of artists will use um, a paper towel to create their clouds in a painting, and that's because you can go back in and really lift a bunch of the color. Okay, there's not a lot of separation here yet, but when we use a pencil line there, then we'll see the separation. So here I'm gonna do the same thing over here, trying not to get it all over the orange. It's right above it. There we go. Okay. And now I'm going to use a clean part of the paper towel to pick a lot of that back up. There we go. So there's a just a hint of sky there. And then we're also going to put that hint of sky up here. Now, because what we have up here is pink, it's okay to put that up near the pink because pink and blue together and just make sort of a purpley look to it. So let's bring it in and feather, feather the edge. Feather, feather, feather. All right, there we go. Now I'm going to get another paper towel because I don't trust it. And I'm just going to lift some of that up. Now, remember what I was just saying about the paper? This pad moved with me not too long ago. And so the paper, this first sheet of paper that was here got uh, roughed up. So you can see that the, the paint is unevenly um, absorbing into the surface. That's not the fault of this company, uh, Canson Montval. It's the fault that I had it open like this and it was scuffed between a bunch of other pages. So don't fault the manufacturer there. They're fine. <laughs> okay. So let's use some yellow watercolor pencil because remember how I said we added some white in there so I can go over it with the watercolor pencil. And what am I doing? I'm intensifying that yellow a little bit by using the watercolor pencil. Now I can choose to, I can choose to um, use water on that and blend the color in or not. It's up to me. I can leave the pencil marks if I like the way that the pencil marks look. But I love intensifying the, the uh, 
color using a pencil like this. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and intensify that by adding a little bit of water to it. So I'm going to use a small brush. I don't want to use the big brush. We're getting more into the detail part of working the painting right now. So I'm just softening those edges just a little bit. Just bringing it in, bring it in, bring it in. So that everything sort of feathers. But that's how you can get a good uh, color definition is using these pencils. So that was the yellow on the sun. Now let's, um, actually before we do the edges of these, I want to put some sparkle watercolor so it can be drying on the river. Now I can see to my naked eye, I can see right here, there's sparkle in the river already. And the sparkle in the river is coming from the fact that fusite as a stone, a natural stone, when it's um, ground up, it's crystalline. So there's actually some play against the light there, but it's not the same as mica. Mica is another type of natural stone, but the mica gives a real um, flashy look to it. The, fus the fusite just has a very light look to it. So what I wanna do is I want this part of the river that's closest to me to look the darkest and then we'll fade it out. So I don't wanna go quite this blue. I'm gonna come over here and go to this blue. So these are uh, sparkle watercolors from a lady, uh, Shimmer Watercolor on Etsy. Shout out to her, she's out in Texas. And I wanna make sure there's a bunch of water on there. And then we're going to just begin to put some of that color in there. Just to sort of give the feel that the, uh, the water is running, right? Some lines, so it looks like the water is running in that direction. And that will help the viewer of the painting. It'll help bring their eye into the painting. And usually the back side back here, when you look for when you look at a body of water, usually right at the line where it meets the land or the sky, it's extra dark. So we are going to take some of this extra dark here, that's this one, and we're just going to run it along the edge right here because that's the way it would look to the eye is that that far edge would be a little bit darker. Remember, if you feel like you put too much, you can easily go back in and adjust it. Okay, we're sort of fading it as it goes that way. Okay, do this, feather it, feather it. Okay, so now if you look at it, you've got some lines heading in that direction that you can see. And of course you can always come back later and add more. Well, not to worry, that's the nice thing about watercolor. I can continue to add or subtract from it. All right, so that at least gives that, um, you know what I'm going to do too, is right here, I want to put a just like a touch, a touch of that dark, just a touch, because it, it fades off into the distance there. There we go. Okay, so now... That was my sparkly bit. I can also go into this area with sparkle if I wanted to add a little bit of the, um, the light color sparkle here, which I'll do off camera. But you, you get the idea for using the sparkle watercolor. Um, okay, so now I want to define these edges right here. That's where these pencils are gonna come in. Oh, I'm gonna move this out of the way. I could just keep taking my colors and keep 
putting more layers right in, right at the edge in order to intensify the edge. But I found that if you use your watercolor pencils, you can get that same effect and you have a little more control. So I actually have a bunch of different sort of greeny, blue-green type colors. So let's pull a bunch of these out. You can see from different manufacturers. And if you need to see what color it is, what do you do? You just grab your handy dandy piece of spare watercolor paper here. And then if I need to see what it looks like, I can do this and that will show me what the color looks like. Uh, I'm looking for one to go up here. So kind of that peacock color. Oh, that's one of the green ones. I don't want that right now. That is like a slate peacock. That's probably going to go over here. I think that's probably closer to what we have here, except that I also have this one. Oh, that one has a purpley look to it. That's going to go on the edge of the purple one here. You see how you really can't tell looking at the pencil here because this pencil lead looks a little more blue, but it comes out a little more purple. So it's going to work well in this area right here where this one is that kind of light peacock blue. So we're going to start by taking this. I'm going to come over here because we really need to define this, this edge between the sky and this way, 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 way in the back mountain. You know, it, normally the way in the back mountain ends up almost fading into the sky, right? But you see how using the pencil here, I can begin to intensify that. And then I can choose to use water or not with that. And I might want to make a little valley like that in there just to give it a little more um, zhuzh. So let's take the little brush. So here I'm doing fine details. So let's take the little brush and come in here and I am just feathering out that edge, feathering it out with just the tiny bit of water. There you go. So now the edge of that, so fun because look at that. Now the edge of that is defined and it separates it from the sky. Oh yeah. Let's put a little bit more in here. So it's okay to put it in even when it's still wet. Even when it's wet, you can still use these uh, watercolor pencils. And then we'll feather it out. But at least we've got some uh, definition going there. Love it. Okay. So now let's come over to this one right here. And don't be afraid to use two different pencils. Okay. So... Just like you can color mix with um, combining paints together, you can also color mix with your pencils. So let's do the initial definition here on the edge of this one. See, if I wanted to draw in trees, I could do that also with the pencils. Oh yeah, I love that. So you're definitely just intensifying what's already there. And shading. All right, so now we've got more of a definition on this mountain. Nice, 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 nice. Now I can see from having uh, put water on it after this dries, I need to intensify where this mountain meets the sky again. There you go. 
And then when we come down here, I want to switch to the one that's a little more purpley, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh, this is such a trick. And I have, I keep my regular colored pencils and my aquarellable, meaning my colored pencils that are water soluble, I keep them separated. So the only thing I have on my table tonight is the, um, the little pot that I bought uh, from a potter. Isn't that nice? I love to support artisans. And so in this pot is all of the water soluble pencils that I have. And I keep that separated from my uh, regular colored pencils. Okay. Isn't that amazing? You can just start to see the definition come about. I'm watching the, of course, the replay over there on YouTube. YouTube is just slightly behind uh, what we're doing here on whatnot. What I'm going to do is I'm just darkening that little tiny area where it meets the other mountain. I just want to get a little bit in there so that there's a little definition of the where they meet. You don't have to go all the way down, but I find it uh, it's helpful if there's a little down and then back. So this one, like I said, would you have known that was like sort of purple just by looking at it? Maybe you would if you do a lot of colored pencil, but let's get this valley down in here. There we go. All right, am I going to soften it? I don't have to, but I might because I have I created this little valley on purpose here. So let's bring that up in there. Okay, so you can see how you would go in and build every one of those mountains. Let's get down here closer to the greens so you can see what happens in the green area because I'll go back later and I'll, I'll switch between and blend these two to do the rest of these two mountains, which are in the blue family. And then this is a light green you can see. And I also have an olive green right here. And I have a sort of a, oh, that's another light green. No, there's a mossy green here. Hold on. This is like a mossy green. So the mossy green will go back here like it is. See how, bam, it just adds that, it adds that definition right there. Like I said, you can choose to you can choose to use the uh, water or not. You can just leave it like that. So there you get a nice line of definition between these two mountains right here. Now this one, I'm going to use the darker olive up in here because this is so dark. If I want to keep it going dark and intensify the darkness, I can use olive on top of there. Whew. Let's take this one in here like that. You see how you can sort of define your mountains in here? Like that. Okay, so that's using a darker olive 
to define that edge. But you can see that by going back and forth with these pencils, I really think the pencils are the game changer. They're what gives you that really nice definition here on your, um, let me make sure I've got you in the center so you can see that well. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, dangerous manatee. I was just explaining how to use watercolors, both uh, in pans, which are these little pans like this, and in tubes like this to create a layered watercolor and then come in with pencils and define the edges of that watercolor to give you that ethereal um, effect and feel. And then uh, this is what a finished one looks like right there. I did this one a little bit differently because the yellow here I diffused a little more and here I made it more of a ball going down over the back of the mountains. But we are gonna do this giveaway right now. Um, for this card, it is an original artwork um, that I indicated on the back there, and it'll come with an envelope in 